All right, it is April 3rd, 2023, Human Design Catalyst. Thank you all for coming. And thanks, Mike, for hosting at Fasciation Space. Very, um, these have been going so well. So really, I mean, this is probably our eighth or ninth one in our, since restarting it, and it's just really flowed this time. It's been really nice. So hopefully we'll keep it going. So today the topic is projectors. And uh, I have some notes here, but we'll also be kind of opening it up to questions. We already had uh, one question come up, which what is the difference between projected channels for a projector versus projected channels for a generator? And the question, do you get bitter if you um, have projected channels to a generator? Well, everyone has every channel, whether they're activated or not. And everyone gets bitter. And there's more projected channels than anything else. So there's more bitterness than just about anything else. Unless you want to say there's more disappointment because there's more openness in the chart, and that's the theme of the reflector. Mm -hmm. But I guess we could say the not-self of the world is tied between disappointment and bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference? Well, the disappointment of the reflector relates to expectations not being met, and it relates to the G-center. Everything about the, the reflector depends on the G-center. Um, interestingly, we have a self-projected projector and a mental projector, who both have special relationships to the G-center, but in different ways. Mental projector, undefined G-center. You have to have an undefined G-center to be a mental projector. You can't have anything defined below the throat. Uh, as we were talking about last week, for the mental projector, environment is so key. And the rule of the undefined G-center, which is also a rule for reflectors, who also all have undefined G, is basically the right people take you to the right place. In the right place, you meet the right people. So the challenge is you might have a best friend who doesn't actually take you to the right place. Because see, you have an undefined, anyone with an undefined G, all the people in their life who have a defined G are basically telling them, oh, you should go here, you should go there, you should wear this kind of clothes, you should listen to this kind of music, you should check this out, you should... See, the defined G people, like me, Amy, Mike, yeah, actually, wait, what about you? Okay, okay we only have two undefined Gs in this whole place, so that's great, yeah. Kiki, self-projected projector, so you have, your G center is your authority. And even when it's not the authority center for other people, in some sense, it is always behind the authority for, for everyone, even the, even the undefined G, because it is the spirit, it's the magnetic monopole, and it's ultimately what sets your direction in life. So it's, it's very, very important. But we can see that, um, you know, for the mental projector, their relationship to the G center is going to be one of existential crisis, because it's basically going to be Everyone else sees in me this or that identity, but truly my identity is flexible and open and kind of chameleonic. And you have all these defined G people who are all kind of bastions of burning their fire for what they like and saying, this is the way. It's like you learn how to drive from a defined G. They say, this is how you drive. Then some other defined G comes along and says, no, this is how you drive. Well, you have two different ways of driving. Some people are driving really quickly. Some are more laid back. Some are... I mean, all of the different ways of the world are the ways of the defined G. The undefined G doesn't really have a way. It learns many ways, and it can adopt them and use them as it sees fit. But the real challenge when you have an undefined G is to get real about what other people's ways are actually um, for you or not. You know, to be wise about it, because you could have the best friend in the world, or you could have a mentor, or a boss, or a teacher, or a partner or a family member, and they could be essentially imposing their way on you so deeply that 20 or 30 years can go by before you then have the existential crisis, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing in this life? Am I really supposed to have this you know, vocation? Am I really supposed to be in this relationship? Am I really supposed to be here? Now the problem with the undefined G is that it's always, its answer as the not self is always, I gotta find another relationship. I gotta find another job. I gotta find another place. I gotta find other people. It's not actually the job of the undefined G to do that. So this is what's so hard about it. Because, you know, you would think, okay, first problem, the undefined G that gets so heavily conditioned by their upbringing that they're essentially imprinted to be a sort of cookie cutter image of somebody else's G center. Because remember, the G center is the center of identity. So they've taken on somebody else's identity. So that's the first problem, but then it's out of the frying pan into the fire because they wake up one morning and go, this isn't really me, I'm gonna find out who I really am. Well, the not self theme of the undefined G is searching for identity, love, or direction. 
So trying to find it is actually the not self theme. Instead, the sort of true self of the mental projector, and this is also true of the reflector, although they're very different because the reflector has a primary relationship to the cosmos in a very different role in the totality. I mean, an actually an opposite role in the totality. In a moment, I'll talk about the projector roles, and we'll see that the reflector is at the end of the long tail, and the mental projector is at the tip of the sphere. But there is a sort of funny alpha and you know, omega quality of them both having undefined G-centers and both being here to become wise about the G-center. But in any case, uh, especially for those two types, which by definition have undefined G, because any other type can have a defined G-center. Um, but those are the two types that cannot have a defined G, the, the reflector and the mental projector. And so for them, it is really important um, that that they are aware of who in their life it's basically like starting to notice where you met somebody how comfortable were you there well, we met at my house well my house makes some people really uncomfortable they they would you know just all the clutter and just how messy it is but if you're comfortable there you're like well i could be this guy's friend because I'm comfortable in this place, other people might not be. Other mental projectors might be very uncomfortable in, in that sort of environment. Similarly, um, you know, we went to Susan's, the great spot. You know, you're like, this place is great. I'm like, that's a good sign. It's a good sign that you found somebody with a defined G or two people with, with you know, defined G. And you also met Kiki there, who's a self-projective projector with a defined G. So this is a sign that these are three people in your life because they've either taken you somewhere you're comfortable or met you somewhere you're comfortable, that they can probably help you find a good relationship, find a good job, find a good place to live. So instead of looking for those things yourself, you just inform the people that are defined G and let them do the work for you, right? But, it, right, but it's, but it's tricky because there can be this existential crisis of, I have to find it, I'm stuck here, the grass is greener somewhere else, I should go where the grass is greener, I'm gonna find it myself, I'm going to set out on my journey as a seeker, and then they spend their whole lives kind of looking and searching and trying to find it themselves. So in any case, um, you know, we, we can see that the disappointment comes, it, this disappointment is always related to the G-center. And so the reflector as the body graph that has no activation at all, and by the way, the most gates you can have activated out of the 64 are 26 gates. Most people have less than that activated because most people have duplicate activations, that is, conjunctions in astrology, right? Where one activating body is conjunct a different activating body, and so most people might only have about 20 gates out of 64 activated. So the majority of our chart is not activated which is which is kind of like the reflector and so that's why i was kind of i started this off by saying well the majority of our channels are projected and most of those channels because there's there's so many channels that are projected channels um 26 or something that you know bitterness is the predominant theme of the not self mm -hmm. but also because lack of activation openness in the chart is so predominant mm -hmm. disappointment is another dominant theme mm -hmm. and then in a different way because 70 percent of the world has a defined sacral Frustration is a dominant theme. Mm -hmm. So really only anger, as far as the not-self themes, is kind of the rare one. Mm -hmm. And that's just because, you know, it's rare in that it has an impact. Anger has a big impact. Road rage, you know, people get killed, people get hurt because of anger. Anger is momentary flashes that, that impact. It's different than frustration, which builds up. It's different than bitterness, which builds up very slowly, as we'll go into when we look at um, the kind of projector mechanics, and it's different than disappointment. Yeah. But then because of like manifestors and MGs um, without a direct motive to the throat that still have anger as a signature for a manifestor, fully the signature for an MG, part of the signature, doesn't that mean that there's also an anger potential in any motor? Yeah, and also because everything is tending towards the throat, uh, we are all mechanically trying to be manifestors. It's just that you know, manifestors succeed. But every type is trying to be the manifester because the energy is looking for expression through the throat. And, and so there is a mechanical reason. Um, it's not just that people want to be a manifester because they heard being a manifester is cool or whatever. They're born wanting to be a manifester. Mm -hmm. Every projector, I actually had a note here. What do all projectors have in common? I have two things listed. Do you have any answer to that? No, I don't either. Well, they all have an undefined sacral, so they don't know when enough is enough. Mm -hmm. 
and they're all trying to be manifestors, which is actually something all types have in common. But it's definitely common for the projectors, mm -hmm. in that, you know, the projectors are all trying to be manifestors, and um, so it's something to keep in mind that, that that is a mechanical thing. And then, yeah, the anger that comes from from that. So just because you don't have a not self theme doesn't mean you won't recognize that theme in your life. I mean, plenty of projectors get frustrated or get angry or feel disappointed. Uh, disappointment in particular, I mean, each of these key keynotes kind of has to be unpacked and understood in its context and kind of understood what Ra meant when he came up with them because these are really his way of structuring things. He had 4323, the channel of structuring. And even though that, that is a, a projected channel, even though Ra was a manifester, he only had projected channels. And this will circle back nicely to the question of how is it then for a manifester with only projected channels? Was his dominant theme bitterness then, mm -hmm. right? Or the first question we started with, um, is a, a projected channel and a generator the same, you know, and so on. So that's how I got on this whole thing by just saying, you don't have to have a channel activated to know, to experience that. When we say that the not self theme of a type and the opposite of that, the signature of the type, what we're talking about is how that mechanic of their aura itself uh, has a dominant theme to it. Mm -hmm. And so even though Ra only had projected channels, I'm sure he knew what bitterness was, it wasn't a big deal to him because manifestors aren't here to have the sweet success and they aren't here to try to overcome that bitterness. What they're here for is peace. At a fundamental level, they're craving peace, they're searching for peace, and they don't believe it's possible. They believe that only ever there will only ever be anger. Anger from people interfering with them. Anger from people getting in their way. Anger from people um, stopping them from doing what they're, what they're trying to do. And that's because their aura itself is a repelling aura. You don't have a repelling aura unless you're a manifester. You can be a manifesting generator with manifestor channels. You don't have a repelling aura. You have a generator aura. It's a big enveloping bear hug that attracts people to you and draws them in. You know, you can be a, a projector and have this penetrating aura, and you have to learn all about that penetrating aura, and all about how that penetrating X-ray vision into people works, and the bitterness you feel when you've penetrated someone in an uninvited way mm -hmm. with your aura, and they they don't invite you and they don't recognize you and they you know shun you for that, and you get bitter from that. A very different dynamic than the manifester aura. Is that uh, we should uh, phones please? Uh, then the manifestor aura, where they are, um, you know, they're going through their entire life. I mean, uh, Ra described, he was saying that being a manifestor is like it's it being impossible to ever be invited. You know, projectors complain about not feeling invited, not feeling welcome. Well, as a manifestor, you walk into a cafe and they all turn and look at, who invited that person? What's that person doing here? It's like the permanent inability to ever be invited. Mm. It's not even possible, not even in the mechanic. They have a repelling aura. And beyond that, the manifestor aura puts people off because they are always a little bit concerned that at any moment in time, the manifestor could do something without informing mm. and, could man and could impact that whole situation. And so people are constantly on edge around manifestors and they're constantly guarded and they're constantly doing what they can to sort of create fail-safes to protect against actions that manifestor might take to completely ruin everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not just some imaginary thing. Manifestors do completely ruin everything, and they don't even realize it half the time. Mm -hmm. They are completely oblivious to it. I have uh, just a short manifestor story for those who don't believe me. I had a couple <laughs> weeks of planning an event, and we had all these events planned you know, within the event. It was like a lot of Burning Man people. So we would do, um, we would do for instance... Um, scavenger hunts and they would be really fun like one of the one of the clues would be he's very handsome and he's wearing a bandana and a fur coat and it's the dog that has a bandana around his neck you know then you go and find behind the the collar of the dog and you find the next clue and it's like a painting and you go there and the next clue well we had the last clue and the last clue was actually taped to our hostess's back and nobody saw it. It's one of those things where it's like invisible, you know, like if, if you just get used to it. And she had a big piece of paper that like said clue on it, just like taped to her back. And nobody saw it. And then we had, and we were right in the middle of doing this, uh, this scavenger hunt. We'd been out for probably 45 minutes, maybe 20 of us, 30 of us doing it. Well, the manifester was doing the next event and we were coming close to the end. So we were about to start um, doing uh, clues for it, kind of giving people hints and stuff. 
And he came in and got everyone to put on their shoes and go outside because he was doing fire dancing in about 15 minutes. Uh, he didn't inform anyone that that's what he was doing, anything at all. And he knew we were right in the middle of it, but he knew what the last clue was. And so he had assumed, oh, they'll be able to find it outside. He was like, everybody, it's outside. Well, it's not outside. It's on, the back, it's on her back. Mm -hmm. Plus, it was dark out. Mm -hmm. So nobody saw it, and nobody got the last clue. And everybody ended up so frustrated. And we also had the last clue pointed to a box to open, which had prizes for everybody, which we didn't get to. Wow. And the entire thing was ruined. Because he literally was like, attention, everyone, put on your shoes. The clue is outside. And got everybody to go outside. Mm. <laughs> and they were like, uh, the clue's not outside. He's like, yeah, but you go outside and they'll find it. We're like, that's not how it works. And nobody found it. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like shivering in the cold. And it took him 20 minutes to get ready. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was just a complete disaster. So manifestors have a way of just ruining everything by not informing. You know, he should have told us, you know, I'm going to tell everyone to go outside. We would have said, well, no. This is, but they, but they don't want to hear no. And they, they're used to hearing no their entire life. Mm -hmm. And they know that they're going to hear no if they start telling people things. So they don't inform and they just have a big impact and ruin things. And this is why manifestors, you know, are considered kind of the dangerous type. I mean, um, when I first heard about them, I was like, I bet Orson Welles is a manifestor. Because he did the H.G. Wells, uh, you know, War of the Worlds broadcast. Didn't inform anyone it was fiction. People killed themselves because they thought it was an alien invasion. They jumped out the window, you know. I mean, this is manifestor impact through lack of informing. So in any case, that, that really gives you the context of what the difference is and how the channels work. Because it's easy to look at some projected channels and understand how the channels work and go, oh, I understand how this person works. No, you don't, unless you know their type. You don't understand how Ra operated until you know what it's like to be someone who's permanently never invited anywhere. You know, just imagine uh, not even being able to be invited because everyone's constantly, not, you know, constantly ill at ease that you could do something that would impact them in this negative way. And you have to continually reassure them you're not going to by building trust, by informing. That's why the manifestor strategy is informing. Once a manifestor is informed enough, we go, oh, okay, that's a nice manifestor. They're going to tell us before they destroy everything. You know, at least they'll give us time to get out of the way. You know, we'll at least be able to leave the building before they blow it up. So um, that's kind of, you know, they're still going to blow it up, but at least we know and we can adjust and we can plan for it. So that's really the answer there is that the, the not self signature has to do with the aura type and that you can have all projected channels. I mean, I heard someone say on TikTok the other day, to be a manifester, you have to have at least one manifester channel. No, you don't. Ra didn't. He only had projected channels. To be a manifester, you have to have a motor connected to the throat. That can connect through, and you can't have it defined through sacral, of course. So, okay. Um, so, yeah. So, as far as the question of how do they operate, yeah, there are still mechanics on a per-channel basis. Like, obviously, regardless of type, if you have 1858 channel of correction, it's going to be kind of annoying to correct people not being invited. Um, yes. You know, that's going to... But at the same time, it doesn't really build up bitterness in the same way because, as we'll see when we get to it, um, bitterness is a very long-term mechanic. It takes years and years and years to build up. You know, a projector can say... Oh, I'm bitter that I didn't get invited to this party. Well, you're bitter because the last eight years of your life have been a lie or something like that, right? It's not, you don't get bitter overnight. You know, I have a, a projector friend who spent 15 years in New York uh, working in the music industry and he came back to Seattle where I was you know, living at the time and everything was the only way to actually get ahead as in the music industry is brown nosing and it's all just fake and it's all about who you know and nobody respects real talent and nobody really recognizes anything and you know basically being a hater he's a complete hater on everything he didn't get to be that way overnight it took 15 years for that bitterness to build up it wasn't just like he went and wanted to get a gig and they're like no we're not interested and, you know, no 15 years of no one being interested 15 years of nobody caring what he has to say. 15 years of nobody caring what he has to offer. 15 years of nobody, nobody really valuing him or recognizing him. That's what led to the bitterness. So, because remember, the, the projector is here for success, and it's the same, the same rule there. Success is also not an overnight thing. Overnight success is temporary success. It's a one-hit wonder. It's a flash in the pan. True success is something that builds up year over year over year, by successfully navigating life decisions. So that's following strategy and authority. Mm -hmm. All projectors have the same strategy, waiting to be invited. Ra did say that the self-projected projector is the only one that doesn't need to be invited, but that might have just been him being flippant. Um, <laughs> which is an interesting comment he made. I, I, don't, I wouldn't read too much into that because we know that the strategy of the projector is to wait to be invited. Um, I think what he meant is just that the self-projected projector can hear themselves, can hear the truth of their 
own navigational system and if it knows where they need to go, they basically are there to be slaves to their own inner compass. And nobody has to invite you to be in the right place, basically. Um, but we do know that the strategy of all projectors is technically the same, which is to wait to be invited. The authorities are quite different and they have very different mechanics. And to be self-projected versus mental projector, such a different dynamic, like we were kind of talking about last week. Mental projector, it's all about people and place. And it's about being wise about who is in your life. It's really about who is in your life, not what. It's less about your job and more about who you're hanging out with. Because if you're hanging out with the right people, you're going to have the right opportunities for vocation. And if you don't like your job, you can ask the right people to help you find a better job. Because they are the right navigational system for you and you feel comfortable with them. And if you are tired of going to the same restaurant, they'll take you to a new restaurant and you'll probably like it because they're the right people for you. Um, it's not also not to say that someone will always be the right person forever. I mean, it could be the right person at that time. You outgrow certain people in certain groups. And Ra was careful to say for the mental projectors, um, and for anyone with an undefined G, just because someone took you to your favorite restaurant doesn't mean you owe them. You know, it doesn't mean you have to stay being their friend because that could have been a time and a place thing. But overall, uh, as you make correct decisions as a mental projector, you kind of have more and more people you can trust to be good navigators in your life. And you can just inform them, which is not initiating, it's just informing. Hey, I'm kind of lonely. I'd like to be in a relationship. They will play matchmaker for you. Defined G, they're all trying to anyway. I mean, even without telling them, they're trying to. It, you'll have the opposite problem of using your discernment of which person has the right, you know, the right guidance for you. Because they're all signposts and they're all saying go here, and one says go there, and you'll get you know, whiplash from all the different directions they're pointing you in. So that, that's really the challenge for the undefined G. For the self-projected projector, it's all about hearing when you're speaking from your, your defined throat channel from the G-Center and versus hearing when you're speaking from a different voice. Because we have 11 different voices and only four of them can possibly be self-projected. Um, and so if you have the 1020, it's saying things like, I am now. If you hear yourself say, I am, or I am not now doing that, I, like, I'm not doing that. Like, if you hear yourself say, like, I am not, it's very different than saying, I feel like we could maybe do this, or I feel, like we were talking about this the other day, like how the feeling can really come and go, but what you can actually trust is the voices uh, of your particular channels. And so, for instance, with the 1-8, that's all about knowing if you can contribute or not, knowing if, you know, if, if it's pointless to even try to contribute. And if someone says, oh, you should, you should tell them your idea, and you go, ah, it's not even, what's the point? There's no, there's no point in even telling them. That's, you know you can't contribute. You can trust that assessment because that's kind of in your wheelhouse. But if, you, if you're saying, you know, I feel or I felt really sad the other day, I feel like this is a bad decision for me, well, it's hard to really know based on the feeling. Um, and then there's different, you know, splenic projectors are going to have the spleen guiding them, which is going to be an instantaneous, momentary um, sort of, you know, it happens in the moment. Usually a kind of a whispered voice or a hunch or an intuition. Emotional projectors, which are the most common type, um, they are going to have, you know, clarity that emerges over time that they can really learn to notice how some days they feel invincible and nothing's wrong and other days nothing's right and nothing can make it better. And they can start to kind of notice when they've been through enough of that. Um, and I don't know if you have more good advice for, you know, I always just say play hard to get. That's my advice for anyone who has an emotional definition is uh, don't just immediately jump into things, but give yourself time to kind of go through. Don't jump to conclusions, right? Mm -hmm. And then the rarest authority for the projector is the ego authority. Or, uh, yeah, I, I would say it's the rarest. It's only one channel. Right? Because self-projected has four channels. Mental projectors can have six. Uh, six yeah. Um, but the ego projectors can only have one channel. That's the uh, 2551. And so ego projector is kind of like the self-projected projector, but it has an undefined throat. And, um, you know, that's, or it can anyway. I mean, I guess there are, oh no, because it'd be a manifester if it had a defined throat. Yeah, that's right. So funny. So interesting how that works when you get into the mechanics. One channel and only one channel that they can have. Yeah, it's only one channel. Well, I guess you could have an Ashna channel. Ashna to head. 
Right, that's true. Are that's the, true. So there could be yeah. some yeah. mental projector channels as yeah. well, and then the ego and the G center would kind of override it. But it's just because there's a hierarchy of authorities. It's like what's loudest in the body. And so anyone who has the emotional center defined, the solar plexus, automatically has emotional authority because that's the loudest chemistry in the body. It overrides all other chemistry. Mm. Um, and really what you're doing by waiting for the clarity is waiting for that chemistry to get out of the way so you can get in touch with the subtlety of you know, the magnetic monopole guiding you and things like that even. Um, so in any case, yeah, if you're an ego projector, they're probably one of the least understood types, but it's really about having the willpower to do something and noticing when that willpower is there or not and noticing when your heart is really in it or not. And that's something that they learn um, learn that they, they can't in good conscience say they will do something unless they, they truly have the energy to back it up. And it will change their tone of voice even though they have undefined throat. And it will change their overall um, sense of commitment to something and so on. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, which which one trumps which one? The ego center or the spleen? The spleen trumps the ego. Yeah. The yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Can we go back to um, self projected? Sure. So, um, I'll, I'll put context into it. So I have. Yeah, sorry, just waiting. <laughs> well, anyone anyone talking, we ask to kind of go on the screen. It's, it's, yeah, so you can see. Um. So there's somebody in my life who's a self-projector projector. I have a hard time being around them when I don't want to do what they want to do. And so I guess my question ultimately is, what kind of advice, I'm putting you in the mix, but what kind of advice would you offer for, if somebody's a self-projector projector and they know what they want to do, how they inform or how they work with that? You probably just shouldn't hang out with that person because you're an undefined G and what you're saying is their direction is not your direction. Sometimes I like it and sometimes I don't. But if I hop yeah. along and I don't like it, it's a shit show. That's true of any defined G. I mean, that would also be true if I took you to Albuquerque and you and I wasn't the right person for you or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because when I go to Albuquerque with my 2946... It's the it's the Mr. Toad show. It's you know Jonah's Jonah's wild ride, and I'm going to the thrift stores, and I'm I'm hurrying up. I, I you know I have a defined route. I'm like hurry up, let's get out of here. This place sucks, and people are you know I'm leaving without them if they don't. And then at other places I'm sticking around. They're like Jonah, Jonah, come on, we've been here. I'm like just give me more time. It's the Jonah show. I mean that that's how it is for the defined G. So I would just answer that yeah, and if you have thoughts as well, but that's really a defined undefined G. That's really fundamentally that dichotomy there is that you're on her ride. Right. So, yeah. Well, and I guess what I'm saying is, like, for somebody who's living that life, like, they're going to run into people who don't want to do their party. So how do, how do they inform? Like, to well, me, they, it's about they need informing. to be invited to, they need to be invited to, to take that person to, on their party. So basically, if you're not inviting her to take you places, then she's not being invited. And that's, that's what I'm saying. But if you have ideas on, on that. I'm just going to bring in the whole, uh, so all your openness just co collects, it absorbs whatever is around, and it camel humps it for a while, too. So if you're getting really mixed results from one person where sometimes you really like what they're showing you and sometimes you really don't like what they're showing you mm -hmm. in that directional way, then it could be, I, you know, because they're either, when you really like someone as a whole, you're going to like everything they bring to you. And if you really don't like someone as a whole, you're not going to like anything they bring to you. God. even if they're an expert in whatever they're trying to bring you. And so when you're getting mixed results, a lot of the time what's happening is you have just hung out with someone that you do like, and you're carrying that liking into the next person you're seeing that you don't like, or vice versa. Yeah, right? you, you have like an abundance of charity. You can yeah. almost say. You're or the opposite. Charity. You you've just hung yeah. out with someone you hate, you're around this person you like, and all of a sudden you're not, you apparently don't like what they're doing either, even though you normally like what they're doing. Yeah, it's a really good point because the G-Center imprints everything with its identity. So every place, going back to you know Albuquerque, my, I, I love making like dream days of like, okay, first we're going to go to Family Thrift, the best thrift store in the world. You don't like this thrift store? What's wrong with you? You know, it's kind of, I'm so opinionated because I have a defined G. I love this place. And I just think it's incredible. And then we're going to go to the best restaurant. You don't like this restaurant? What's wrong with you? It's kind of the defined G is always going to have this. And it works with other um, centers too. In fact, Ra used the sacral and the G both as examples of this where he said uh, in you know, one lecture he's talking about an undefined G 
um, being shown how to make love. And oh, you learn this is this is the way. And you're with this one partner and you learn that's how it is. And you're with someone else and you're like, it's not like this at all. What? I've been like completely misled. Like it can be this other way? How is that possible? In a different lecture, he was actually saying that that's true of the sacral, which would make it true for all projectors, regardless of defined G or not. Um, but it's also true of the solar plexus in a different way too, because each of the centers, when they're defined, has a very fixed way of being. So a defined solar plexus is going to have a fixed way of processing its emotions and there's a fixed next step when the emotions are here and it's a tribal definition the next step is it to go way down there or or it's going to keep going and it's kind of steadily climbing until it can't take it any longer and then it's going to blow up and if you've only been around that your whole life and then you're around an individual you know emotional definition 1222 you're completely shocked and have no bearings at all because you're like this isn't how emotions are supposed to be you're not supposed to be friendly one moment and antisocial the next you're not supposed to be moody like this where you know we learn how things are supposed to be for the sacral uh, we learn what the sacral energy is supposed to be like and uh, and for the G center it's basically learning all of the ways of doing things this is how you drive this is how you fish this is how you I mean with plumbing there's a way to do plumbing no 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 slow down when you're doing this and don't don't turn it more than that amount of time and you know and the plumbers will endlessly disagree Different defined G people will say, oh, don't listen to that person. They're a crank. They have no idea what, what they're talking about. You know, don't listen to... I always used to have a joke um, with uh, um, you know, Jenny, was I would always say, this is the way. And then she wanted to make a meme of, um, of a guy holding a sign saying, there's more than one way. You know, mm -hmm. kind of like the, like, the, like the guy saying, like, you know, kind of like, you know, end is coming or, or one of those things, like a conspiracy sign. But it's like, there's more than one way. You know, there's more than just the way the defined G tells you. Because... I will just say this is the way you do it. Oh, you want to mix a record? This is how you do it. Oh, I mean, I still, it's, it, it, people think 1858 can be opinionated, sure, or 1762, but the defined G is like endlessly, it's what I love and what I hate. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm in the recording studio, I love to start recording before people start tuning. Why? Because you get the best take when they're rehearsing. And I can't stand a, a, a you know, recording engineer that has everybody play out all their energy for two hours and says, okay, we're finally ready to record, let's go. To me, you've just ruined the entire vibe and everything. I, mean, I like to turn the lights down and get the incense burning. You know, it's as much about creating an atmosphere as, as anything. And that's true for, um, I don't... Your G is defined experientially. That, that too. So I have a very fixed way of what the experience should be and that it's meant to be experiential. And we're meant to, you know, we should go in the experiential direction, that the experience is more important than the practice and, and all of it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's my, just my opinion, man, as they say. <laughs> but, you know, it's my mechanical opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's my, it's my defined G, so... So anyway, so we, as we see, there's a lot of different authorities and different ways of being, but I just want to kind of set the context that when we're talking about projectors, we're talking about an aura type. Regardless of projectors, bitterness is the not-self theme, the dominant theme. We'll talk about how that works. Now I want to just give some more context and kind of start with the history of projectors. So projectors emerged in 1781. And it's not even like they emerged overnight. We are in what's called the Plutonic Interregnum from 1781 to 2027. And that is a phase of time during which we have essentially, um, the nine-centered being has emerged. We have evolved, we have mutated. And new, a new form that we can't really even call Homo sapiens anymore has emerged. Ra called it Homo transitus, because it's human in transit, or man in transit. And um, it's basically this transitory being that has emerged. And this is really interesting for people. They, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. If we evolved and changed, would anyone notice? Well, it turns out, no. I mean, some people on Twitter noticed. Have you seen those threads about, this was my dad when he was 21, and it looks like a 40-year-old. Or this guy was 36, and he looks 70. I mean, if you haven't seen this, you know, look it up. Are people aging faster? You, you really just, or, or are people aging slower, slower rather? Yeah. Did people age faster before? And if you look that up, You'll, you'll see that there's people don't know what to make of it. And you go on Reddit, and then people say, well, obviously this is because of quality of life. Not really. You can't really explain it just through quality of life, because there are people that have an unbroken chain of quality of life that is completely unchanged for hundreds of years in certain communities. 
and you know they are still evolving diff differently. I mean, it is an interesting question though of whether there are still seven centered beings. Um, it's even an interesting question of if there are remnants of five centered beings. I mean, we know that we intermixed with the Neanderthal, which was the five centered being. So the last major change though, from the five to the seven centered being, the last Neanderthals died out around 30,000 years ago. And there was around 30,000 years more of intermixing. So 60,000, maybe even more of, of intermixing. I mean, really the Homo sapiens began emerging, I think around 90,000 to 100,000 years ago. So there was really up to 70,000 years of sort of coexistence. Um, with our Plutonic interregnum and the move from the seven to the nine centered being, that's been much more rapid, it's just a few hundred years. So it's interesting how uh, the, the, the times that we've been able to witness rapid evolutionary change have been so great. And also just some very interesting synchronistic things. It all began with the discovery of Uranus, then we have the discovery of Neptune, and then the discovery of Pluto. And these all coincided thematically with what was going on in the world at that time. Um, a man named Rick Tarnas has a great book, Cosmos and Psyche, where he studied uh, the last 500 years of basically Western history, and even some kind of you know, greater history going back to 600 BC and beyond, um, through the lens of archetypal astrology, particularly the synodic cycles of the outer planets. And so what he found was that even the discovery of planets coincided with thematics in the world at that time. Neptune was discovered during a time of spiritualism and has become associated with a lot of psychic and so on. And Pluto was in the heyday of psychology and obviously 1781 marks the discovery of uh, Uranus, which was around a time of great upheaval and uh, kind of the height of the Enlightenment and then the French Revolution shortly thereafter. And, just a very interesting, you know, revolutionary time. And so what I've noticed personally in studying these things is that um, we basically had the scaffolding in place for the nine-centered being for thousands of years, and it was just filled out. And so you find that in any ancient mystical system, such as astrology, where the discovery of the new planets essentially took over um, the rulership of science. So Aquarius used to be ruled by... Saturn is now, I mean, Uranus, right? And then if you go past it, you see Pisces used to be Jupiter, and so on. Um, and of course, Scorpio and Pluto. And you also find that same scaffolding in the Enneagram. Are there any fans of Enneagram here? Anyone who studied it? So the Enneagram is said to be an ancient system. It sure seems to be that way. We don't have a ton of evidence of it going back beyond a couple hundred years. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that it does follow the same uh, archetypal progression of planetary archetypes where if you start with the, the uh, Enneagram type 3, that's represented by the Sun, 2 is the Moon, uh, very lunar, the Helper, 1 is Mercury, 9, which is what Mike is, that's Venus, ruled by Venus, 8, the sort of challenger archetype is Mars, you keep going, 7 is Jupiter, they're lovers of life, and uh, are you a 7, do you know? I always thought I was a 2. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm also a fan of tri-types, so people sometimes are a two with a seven fix and so on. Um, it goes to Jupiter, and then Saturn is six, and then if you keep going, five probably also used to be Saturn, and four also used to be Jupiter, but now five is Neptune, or five is Uranus, rather, and four is Neptune. And so it's interesting how the scaffolding was in place, just like astrology, where it kind of goes... Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter. It just kind of like goes back, and then that like unfolded. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. It's almost like it had a little curly cue at the end that folded back on itself. It got to the end and started going back. It hit Saturn, and it doubled Saturn, did a little U-turn, and went back to Jupiter, you know. But now it's unfolded, and it sort of filled out the scaffolding with the additional planetary archetypes. So I guess my only point is... Um, it's not just like the nine centered being appeared out of the blue, rather it was an evolutionary trajectory where the scaffolding was put in place thousands of years before and was finally filled out, so to speak. Uh, and then people always ask, you know, what's the difference in the seven centered and the nine centered? Uh, I would just say, from my perception, I mean, first of all, you can study 
the Vedic uh, texts, you know, uh, Hinduism, you can study the, the seven center of being. Obviously, there were more chakras than seven. That's the, that's the other thing I hear. Well, you know, there were 280 chakras, or there were 8,000 chakras, or this or that. Well, yeah, but there were seven primary chakras. All of the minor ones were considered almost like pressure points or something like that. Um, and the seven primary chakras, it's my opinion that the ones that really split, that the um, solar plexus and the spleen sort of split off, out of the solar plexus, because there is a solar plexus chakra for the seventh centered being, but it had a different quality to it. It wasn't an emotional awareness at that time because it wasn't yet being used for that. Um, you know, scientists have said there's a second brain, the sort of gut brain in the solar plexus. Uh, that's the evolutionary. There's more neural activity there than anywhere else in the body right now, except maybe the brain. And that's... Um, more nerve endings. More sure. nerve endings, stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, I guess not neural activity, but nerve, nerve activity. Um, and so, you know, that's the solar plexus um, with the spleen. And then I think the heart center probably split into the ego and the G center. Because I see the G center as sort of the higher self heart or the spiritual heart. And what we call the heart center in human design, which is the ego center, is sort of the mundane heart. Um, or the, so that's, that's a different conversation, but it's just kind of giving context that the projector emerged with the nine-centered being. The projector is the newest type, and so that already gives us a clue of what they're here for, which is really to usher in this new age and to be our new leaders, essentially, to be the replacement for the manifester, the older seven-centered way of being a leader. So if the seven-centered being is just trying to be an apex predator and essentially all about the ajna, we kind of emerged from a splenic awareness, which is the animal you know, survival awareness, to an ajna, and now we're developing a solar plexus awareness. Basically, this this you know trajectory from survival concerns to the domination um, via the mind to now having emotional receptivity and you know emotional. Uh, basically, this new what used to only be a motor is now doing double duty as a motor and an awareness center, the uh, solar plexus, and it will eventually lose its motor capacity. It will actually lose its wave and, and only be an awareness center which is an interesting thought. But um, the projector is really here to help usher in the nine-centered being and to replace the manifester, which was the leader at the top of the hierarchy through domination and control and through outsmarting everyone and using the ajna to be the, um, the, the greatest pirate there was. Uh, I remember Buckminster Fuller talked about how the world was run by pirates, basically, and what he meant by that was the people who were seafaring. They could play, they could play other countries against each other and they, because they were the first global peoples that the seafaring peoples, I mean, he was talking about like East India Trading Company and stuff like that, and even going back further, were able to essentially um, dominate and control and colonize and all of these things. Um, and it was really through the supremacy of the ajna, of the mind, in this sort of Machiavellian, Sun Tzu, art of war way. And that was really the seven-centered agenda, to become the apex predator and to essentially dominate through mental control. And that's why you have all these seven-centered practices, which are all based on mental discipline, mind over matter, and using the mind to essentially uh, control the body and, and all of these things. And then the, the new form is not about that. It's actually about um, using the mind to teach and to communicate and to observe and to learn and, and things like that, but no longer to make the decisions that ensure supremacy of dominating and, and so on. Uh, because we're now entering a new era of cooperation and of receptivity of what we've kind of called the right brain, even though it's not really right brain, but it's a holistic approach that's not, um, because, the, because in 1781 is also when we have the emergence of what we call rightness in human design. And uh, we haven't talked much about variable in the past classes for a while, so maybe we can go to a class on variable at some point. But essentially, rightness is um, a new form of cognition that is non-competitive and almost hedonistic. The last time we've seen it was actually in the Neanderthal. Yeah. In a weird way, it's like kind of like the Ajna, which is where the tone splits into leftness and rightness, is sort of like the crucible of what we are um, trying to get born on the planet and always has been, and sort of the splenic life, this life of conquest and colonization and 
strategy in making the planet was sort of looking forward to the Ajna and like this world we're entering into is this sort of looking back at the Ajna from this developing solar plexus awareness where it's like so much history has already happened now and the projector role is to sort of glean to work with systems that are already here to sort of take everything that has already happened and use that to interpret you know what I mean to sort of retroactively birth the thing whereas mm -hmm. from the from the splenic perspective we're looking forward to the birth of the thing. That's a really good point. The manifestors built it all, and now we have to figure out what to do with... Or they didn't build it, but they led the building. We kind of have to find, find what we need from their bones and stuff, you know? And yeah. because when you get into rightness, you get in... We, we did have a variable lecture a few weeks ago, so I hope this isn't too off-topic, but we did get into the thing about how, like, right variable people, like, they do go around, like, holding the whole internet in their brains. That's you know, true, that's the whole, true. Like, the impression of everything. Mm -hmm. That's true, we did cover some of that. Yeah. But then with but when you have an impression of everything, how do you determine what you actually need? You need all these sifters, which is kind of what the projectors are. They like sift through other people's energy signatures and pull out what needs to be mm -hmm. pulled out. Oh, that's a really interesting way to put it, the way of uh, yeah, of organizing or finding what's what's valuable, what's important. I remember James Hillman. Isn't he a projector? He must be. Oh, that makes sense. Um, yeah, he is. He's uh I don't remember his chart. James Hillman, uh, he coined the term cultural retrieval. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that uh, it's such a kind of classic hero myth uh, to say, because he was very anti-hero myth. He's like, can't we have a new myth now? You know, The hero myth is kind of the manifesto myth. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the person who just does it all and saves the day. And, and, um, and uh, he was saying, it's so easy to imagine just we need to build something new. Mm -hmm. But can you actually find what's of value that we've left behind? Cultural retrieval. Go back and, and retrieve something we've lost that we already built but just missed in the clutter of, of chaos of, of life going on. And that's a very kind of projector thought as well. So, yeah, question? Well, I, it's, a, it's a question that's going to bring us way back to the beginning of okay. projector stuff. So that's I, fine. I can no, tell no, you that's what. great. No, do it. Do it. Okay. Let's do it. So you mentioned that sometimes... Um, Projectors use the term use their X-ray vision on people, and people might not like it. Yeah. How does a projector avoid doing that? You wait for the invitation. But like, even if, but like, if it's just an aura, it's not. It's not a conscious. Well, and thing. I think if you're so, here's the thing though: if you're really invited, like a good example is our friend Ray, who couldn't be here today, but he has a bit of the X-ray vision, especially so when he's doing his tarot readings. Uh, they're very intense with people. And it is an always an interesting question. I mean, uh, it kind of came up the other night of are people really inviting him to, to do that? Mm. Because it does kind of amp up. I mean, it is an aura thing, but it's also like if you're on your phone and just hanging out, it's not really as much. And then you look up and then, you know, yep. it's not as, uh, but, but I guess part of it's also if, the, like, I will invite him to come to events to do tarot readings and, um, I will kind of tell everybody, oh, here's my friend Ray, who's a master tarot reader, and he's really incredible, and you've got to get a reading from him, and he, it's life-changing, and he just knows how to, he, like, he's unlike anybody else, and all this stuff, and so they're already kind of being informed, and there's a little bit of, um, you, you know, because I've invited him, I, not that I can necessarily invite on behalf of someone else, but he's, like, welcome in that space, and there's a sort of a power that a projector gains in that space. Ra likened projectors to bards that the bards of days of yore would go from village to village and they would actually be given free food and board just because of who they were, you know, they would be invited in and kind of welcomed in mm -hmm. and recognized. And that recognition would just be, oh, I've heard of you, you're the great bard, please come to my inn. No, no, come to my inn. And they're, they're fighting over which inn can welcome them. I saw a meme on Instagram the other day about Taylor Swift, who's a projector, and how two cities were fighting over who could better welcome her. And they were spending more and more outrageous money and doing more and more to try to like red carpet treatment for her, you know, arrival in that city. And that's projector success. When you really everywhere you go, people are fighting over the opportunity to welcome you somewhere. Um, and you know, obviously, um, there are gonna be people who are haters in that situation as well. But I, I do think when you end up in the right place. Even if somebody randomly walked in off the street there, there is a sort of a mystical thing going on where you have the power from being in that place where you're invited and you're welcomed. And that the fact that other people are welcoming you and are open to your energy sort of lends 
openness to somebody else who might be close to you if they just met you on the street. So it is kind of linked to the time and the place. There is a sort of time and place at work where if you're being invited and welcomed in, then you kind of already have this power there and then somebody new and random comes in and then you might... I mean, I'm still not saying like... It can still happen. Yeah, you can still be rejected in that in those situations. And so it still is a question of checking with the other person and kind of reading the signs of like if, if because it's, I, I don't want it to be like you just have laser eyes for every person you look at ever to be like oh my god this person's looking at me what's wrong with them you know it's not like that it's not like well it can be but I think that's more if you yourself have too much intensity going on inside mm -hmm. that you're so desperate for recognition because you've had so little recognition that it's knowing when enough is enough and knowing it's like give an inch take a mile stuff mm -hmm. like somebody saying thank you and you're going you're welcome compared to you know, it's been amazing. No one said anything to me mm -hmm. for days. I gotta tell you my life story now. It's like, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Like, you're like desperation, you know, dogs sense fear. Well, generators sense desperation Maybe of a projector who's been ignored. Because you, you can, like, yeah. turn your eyes to someone, and that person's like, I feel so seen, but I did not invite this. And they are totally not. It was, there's no snow invitation there. Yeah, there's gonna be an looking. intensity. I mean, it's all, yeah, it's a lot about how intense the projector is, I can speak as a generator of just, sometimes I will invite a little bit and then it is kind of, it's an interesting question of, as a generator, be careful what you're inviting because you might think that you're inviting a little bit, but it's, it's I don't know that you actually can invite halfway. Like for projectors, you're kind of either with them or not. And you either invite them or you don't. And there is a sort of a carte blanche thing where if you really like the projector, you're pretty much trusting them to rearrange your apartment, you know. But, you know, it's like because they will just start doing things like that. I mean, I'm not saying they all will, but there that is recognition a recognition sort of... for the definition that you have, and so it's not all the definition sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's an interesting question of, you know, th there's no half pregnant. Is there half invited? I don't know. Right? It's kind of, <laughs> so. Um, okay, so the role in the totality, this was an interesting, uh, so Ra likened the totality to a single spermatozoa, with a long tail. The end of the long tail is the reflectors. And at the very tip of the sphere, as I was saying earlier, or the very head of the spermatozoa, I guess, is the mental projector. And then, then you have the long tail, and it's the reflectors and the manifestors, and then you have the body of it. And within that body, there are hierarchies within hierarchies within hierarchies. And we can think of the splenic hierarchies, all about survival and caring and, and things like that. And the 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 you know emotional hierarchies and there's there's every different channel represented in these hierarchies and depending what kind of projector you are for instance Mike is an alpha projector so he would be at the head of that logical hierarchy of scientists and business leaders who are making predictions about the future channel 731 well but wouldn't I be def if I was operating in that sphere wouldn't I be deferring to someone who was just a pure self projector projector with that channel because wouldn't they because they are able to, everything that's not defined, you get to see through, right? So if they, if they really want to know what's going on in the development of that like logical circuitry, don't they kind of need to have everything else open? The way I would say it is that if you're looking at the whole totality, every, every channel that you have adds an extra narrowing down filter. So it's like when you're searching through filters and you're like, okay, I want men's shirts, okay, size large, okay, I want a filter like black, and I want them to be with collar, and like each time you get less and less and less and less search results. Mm -hmm. So Mike is meant to be, every projector is meant to be at the top of their hierarchy. They're all meant to be at the top of their respective okay. hierarchy. Whatever that hierarchy is meant to be. And they're meant to have generators under them that they are organizing and helping to work with. So the more This is why there's you, four times as many generators as there are projectors. The more channels you have, the more specific your hierarchy. Well, so, yeah, you have 731 only. Okay, you can work in anything that requires logical leadership. But then you have 2838. Well, it has to be something altruistic or for a higher purpose. 2838, Gandhi had it. Martin Luther King had it. That's a channel of struggle, yeah. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Ivy. Yeah, it's actually just like, <laughs> that's a defined ego, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, but in any case... Uh, no, but it's, it's no, I'm not picking on you tonight, I really not. But, um, but the 2838, if you only have that by yourself, then you might be appropriate to, to be at the head of a hierarchy in, the, in that struggling for purpose, but you don't have the predictive capacity of foresight to the future. Then you have 6124. Then you also have 1949, so it has to be tribal and have that connection. 
Uh, did, did I cover all of them? Is that all of them? Yeah. So, um, you know, with those four channels, it becomes, it went from a thousand jobs that Mike could be good at to a hundred jobs that Mike could be good at to only one job in the whole world that Mike could be good at. And he has to have exactly that job and no other because it's so precise. Be, you know, it's, it's the job that requires the tribal bonding and it requires uh, the sensitivity and it requires the esoteric mystical knowledge of the 6124 and all, all of these things are kind of, it's really a narrowing down. But in any case, whatever pro projected channels you have, and it's really, it's possible to have um, 13 different projected channels for a projector. I mean, it's amazing, because there's 26 activations. So wow. some projector out there has 13 projected channels, you know, and they really, you know, <laughs> there's only 0.2 of a job that's actually for that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but everyone has their perfect job. But what they're meant to be at is at the head of that hierarchy. And the mental projector is at the head of all of the hierarchies in some sense. So they're kind of meant to be the president of the world or the, almost the projector on the council of projectors. You know, the council of mental projectors that then, you know, hears information from other projectors and so on. Um, and yeah, it, it is a good point you were saying, Mike, of how the undefined centers are like windows that you can see into uh, what's going on. And so the mental projectors can see how all the other projectors are doing. They can mm -hmm. see if those tribal projectors are really being fair, even though it's up to the tribal projectors to make their case, this is what I think is fair. Or they can see if the splenic projectors are really being efficient, and each one has their way of being efficient, and so on. Um, and and so, so really, the projectors are meant to be at, at the, the top of their hierarchies. What ends up happening is you have manifestors who won't go into the, into the long tail. Mm -hmm. They they won't go they won't go out to pasture you know they just want to hold on tightly to their to their positions of power. You have generators who somehow ended up in a position of power randomly. How did I end up here? And then they won't give up their space and their gatekeeping and they're blocking those you know projectors from really taking charge. And then you have other projectors who are just in a totally wrong position, but because they've been so desperate for any sort of power, they they won't give it up even though. They're splenic and they're doing the job of a tribal, you know, an emotional projector, and they're logical splenic or something like that, right? So you have, you have this real mishmash. It actually reminds me of that great Osho joke. He said, um, "Heaven is when the um, French are the chefs, the Germans are the engineers, the Swiss are the bureaucrats, the Italians are the lovers. You know, hell is when the Germans are the chefs." <laughs> The Italians are the uh, bureaucrats, the Swiss are the lovers, you know, like you have to kind of, it's really just people are all in the wrong positions, right? They're all in the wrong, and so it's really about playing to their strengths. And that's where the whole, you know, recognition theme of a projector is so important, being recognized for what they're really good at. And um, so that's just about the role in the totality. Now I have a couple other uh, comments here, I guess maybe just... Three more. So, and these are three kind of key points, and we can talk about each of them separately, or we can just cover them and then be done and just have open forum kind of. But uh, the first one is that projectors guide through asking questions, and this is a really interesting one. Um, not only through asking questions, but Ra did use the example of, I guess it's probably a cross of consciousness incarnation cross or something like that, and he was saying how that's kind of, regardless of what incarnation cross the projector's on, what type of projector, it's a very, it's basically one of the ways that projectors operate is by guiding energy through asking questions. Because the question, it's really about finding the right questions, not necessarily finding the right answers. And it really is about changing the questions we're asking, because as a generator, you might go to your doctor saying, how do I sleep better at night? And they might say, the great example I had from a doctor was, when was the first time you were angry? It's a very different kind of question, but it gets you thinking in a completely different way. And so a generator might come, uh, you know, or anyone might really who needs guidance and be asking all of these questions. And it's up to the projector to help figure out what question they can ask that will eradicate 7,000 other questions in a fell swoop. And then weeks or months later, that generator has changed because that question has oriented them in a totally different direction. I mentioned last week um, the trim tab, the trim tab on the ship. Uh, you know, our Buckminster Fuller had on his gravestone, call me trim tab, because the trim tab is a very tiny part of the ship 
that controls the rudder. And if it moves a half inch, your mile is in a different location a week later. So that's how the projector operates through asking questions that slightly shift somebody and then send them in a different direction. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a way, it's like so much of the question is just what's that? And just, just what's that? What's that? Because it's like you're getting something out of this, someone's energy signature, or out of the environment, or something. And you know, the other thing that projectors are really good at is order of operations. Yeah. That's why they have this relationship with systems. So it's kind of like just evaluating what needs to happen in what sequence or whatever. Maybe that's a logical way of putting it. But in any case, it's like there's something they what projectors don't realize is they don't know that they well, they don't realize is that they notice other things that other people don't notice, right? And those things could be of great importance or little importance or whatever. And the projector sort of, if they're paying attention and if their faucet is running clear or whatever when they're taking people in, then it's like the thing that they're pointing out is right at the appropriate level of importance for what's going on in that person's immediate moment. Yeah. Well, that's a great way of putting it because of course projectors have a special relationship to the generator more than the other projectors or manifestors or reflectors. And I'm always saying for generators, it's usually a problem of order of operations. The generator won't do something, and why won't they do it? Because they have to do something else first. Mm. They just don't know what else they have to do first. Mm. But as soon as they do that other thing first, then all their energy is unblocked, and they can get all this other stuff done. Mm. But they're in protest, and they're just sitting around <laughs> on the couch watching TV <laughs> because they, they can't you know, do the thing that they need to do until something else that they don't know what that is first needs to happen. And so they're in this kind of stasis um, and I think that is a way that you know projectors help unblock generators quite a bit. Excellent. Okay, so that was my first uh, note here. We just have two others. The second one is um, bitterness is slow in that projectors have the slowest signature. So I covered this a little bit earlier, but it's very different than manifestors or generators or even reflectors. People think reflectors are so slow, mm. but they don't have the slowest signature. Mm meaning they can get the surprise quickly. And the disappointment, I mean, the disappointment can certainly hurt, but then they can turn it around and have that surprise as soon as they stop jumping to conclusions and give up their expectations. To go back to the reflector, which is kind of how we started this whole thing, which is very similar in its own way, even though it's very different also from the mental projector, um, it's, it's a, it, the secret is about the G-Center and about how expectations really unmet expectations can really damage our spirit and can really kill morale and people can actually um i mean there was uh i mean yeah we, we, we could go that's a whole different topic but that we, we i'm planning on going through the centers and so maybe we'll do a week on the g center at some point but essentially disappointment is related to unmet expectations and surprise is when you weren't expecting something, but it's, it delights you. And it kind of, you know, it's when you didn't have an expectation that it was met. An expectation you didn't even know you had or something that, was, that you would have liked to have had as an expectation if you even knew it was possible. You didn't even know that it could have been possible, so you didn't even think to expect it and then it happens. Right? Grace. You're graced with something. Yeah, so exactly. Being graced. So, so um, that's, you know, but, and then frustration can come and go. Anger is in a flash, and then peace can come after. I mean, Ra always said for, for manifestors, they're really only interested in sex after conflict because they're really just looking for peace, not satisfaction. <laughs> so make up sex is really the only thing manifestors are interested in. Um, or just having some peace from their, uh, you know. But, um, but for the projector, the bitterness and the success are very, very long term. And so the slowness of the signature and the slowness of the not-self theme if it takes 15 years to become bitter, it takes 15 years to stop being bitter too, right? And that's kind of the, the hard part is that for projectors, there's no quick fix for them. Um, their decisions of invitation as well and being invited into things, yeah, okay, being invited to come to Human Design Catalyst, being invited to a party, being invited to grab a drink, sure. But really it's about being invited to your place of where you live, being invited to a community, being invited to a relationship. Did you have anything to add or... No. Yeah. But slow though, right? I mean, you've seen how slow it can be. I think that was an interesting experience. And I think as you decondition, it, it changes that uh, recognition of when the bitterness success, but then you're also talking about long-term success. 
So it changes. Yeah, and so just 